There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another, and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all humankind. Your hosts in England and Sweden, Matthew Russell and Limbold Christmas. Oh yeah, baby, Carl, Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan, Carl Lynn. Sagan. You've you've only you've only you've only dished out one of the big cards in the old quote Bam. world. How that? <laughs> I thought that was uh, particularly appropriate in these troubled times. Mm, absolutely. We've got a big long interview, which is absolutely totally Just... genius about astro <laughs> astro geology. Is that what we're going to call it? Planetary geology. Astro. Planetary. Yeah. Planetary science geophysics all the all the like gcc science subjects mushed into one beautiful thing and i will say one thing that i, I obviously over the years we've made lots of jokes about Rogozin and and found it funny but now i kind of listen back to them and go i don't really find Rogozin a funny in remotely anymore Absolutely. i yeah. think it's context has changed the context has changed, so don't ever listen to my old episodes and realize and try <laughs> Never, and put it ever. and try and put it into context. But yeah, he's just not funny. He's a nasty piece of work and not not fitting for the space. Not fitting for space because the one the one thing that I do know is that when you speak to Helen Sharman or you spoke or I spoke to Mike Fole or any of the astronauts that spent time with Russians on the International Space Station, you know they treat these people as their friends and love them. So it's not the Russian people. Mm. It's something terrible has happened. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Truly deal more kindly with one another, as Carl Sagan said. Yeah, and just remember we're we're sharing this pale blue dot and this is this is it. This is all we've got. Ah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is which is a, a perfect segue into what we're talking about today because we're talking Earth versus Venus versus Mars. Mar- blah. Earth versus Venus versus Mars in an epic slam down showdown. What is the best planet to live on? I think you know the answer, but you might be surprised. <laughs> you might be surprised who comes in second. You won't yeah, exactly. believe what happens at number three. <laughs> yeah. Two planets that scientists don't want you to know about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yeah, so who's our, who's our guest? It's another one that you, you bagged for us, Lynn. Thank I've you. been I've been headhunting. I've been sneaking around in the shadows and and sort of <laughs> poaching all the best guests. If you know me and would like to be on the show, please get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Paul is uh, originally from Ireland, but is now based in the U.S. and he is at I believe the Washington University. <laughs> you won't believe what state it's in. <laughs> we'll get to that part. Um, so he is uh, researching um, planetary geology, I think is the best uh, title, comparative planetary geology, where you specifically compare the surfaces and the interiors as well of different um, planets. Uh, I think mainly in our solar system. I know that he is very active on Twitter and shout out to his Twitter account because uh, you should all follow him. He is at the planetary guy. That's Paul Byrne. Um, and he posts a lot of really cool pictures, uh, specifically um, finding some specific gems from Mars rover pictures. I mean, they post so many Mars rover pictures. It's crazy. Uh, but actually finding some really good ones, uh, you sort of have to troll through it. And Paul does that. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, I've definitely stumbled across his account before and liked and retweeted some of his crazy pictures and, and things. But yeah, I absolutely, I, I loved this interview. I think he's a, he's a really, really brilliant um, communicator as well. And, and he debunked several things that I thought I <laughs> exactly. knew. With, I thought I knew, and it turns you out. You won't no. believe what the moon looks like and things like that. Yeah, so yeah, there's exactly. going to be a lot of uh, sort of mm. BuzzFeed style headlines <laughs> in yeah. today's interview. Yeah, and he's. It's a really fascinating topic as well. Um, you know, we've had a, a talk about astrobiology. Um, and we've talked a lot about sort of planetary stuff, um, at least in the episodes I've been in. And I think the thing that comes up time and time again is the importance of interdisciplinary work and that you kind of can't explore the entire universe without accounting for both physics 
and chemistry and geology and biology and all of these different subjects and then how they interface with each other as well makes them kind of into not something greater than the sum of their parts. Yeah, I kind of got to the end of this one and realised that I need, because I didn't do geography even at GCSE, I think I, <laughs> yeah. I, think I need to do... Um, yeah. I think what I need to learn. Anyway? Yeah, exactly. I need to learn about plate Hills. tectonics. I hear the phrase plate tectonics all the time, but yeah. I'm, I'd be blown if I didn't know what it is. <laughs> but uh, it's obviously pretty goddamn important. Yeah, he's yes, yeah he's exactly. a he's a proper doctor of planetary geology from, and he got it at Trinity College in Dublin. So. So, super, a, super cool. Yeah, so that's a very, very cool institution as well. So so I actually know Paul because uh, me and Paul uh, were teaching a master's level course um, at Uppsala University um, remotely uh, in these uh, pandemic times, or at least the we're still in a pandemic, right? That's the consensus. Yeah, well, I think uh, it's becoming uh, endemic now, isn't it? And 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 end game endemic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, at least, at least last year. Um, so there is actually a course... Um, at Uppsala University in Sweden called Exploring Space Resources, where we talk about um, the resources of space. It's a sort of geo-based course, um, but it is a little bit about, you know, say you found a bunch of diamonds in an asteroid, can I go and just take it? And then w both from a sort of geology perspective and from an astrophysics perspective and from a legal perspective. Um, and it was a really fun course. It's being offered again um, this upcoming autumn, um, and I don't know if it will be offered online, actually, but possibly. So <laughs> stay tuned and, and, and look it up, because no, me I and Paul to, were I, two of the teachers. I might have to do that myself. I yeah, to just that, to come talk to me and Paul. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It'd be quite fun. <laughs> Although everyone go, ah, a bit... Uh, he already knows the teachers. He's going to be. He's going to get. A bit yeah, don't worry. I listened to your podcast episode. I don't need to take this course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. This is this is a really, 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 really good interview. So I, I just, I'm just itching. I'm just itching to get to it. So we just what? start it. So I should just start it. Go on, I dare you. Hey, Kute. You're listening to the Interplanetary Podcast, putting the ace back into space. We are joined on the podcast by Paul Byrne, who is an Associate Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the Washington University in St. Louis. Yes, in the Midwest and not in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Perennially confuses people. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Excellent. And I'm joined just as last week, with Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Hello. I'm back, back, back again with a well, vengeance. We're well, we're talking about planets, so I can't keep you away, really, can we? You really, I'm clawing at the metaphorical door here. I, I'm not going to let you do a, a podcast about planets without getting involved. So, Paul, tell us a little bit about planets. Okay, so, well, we live on one. Oh, They're yeah. interesting. Oh, wait, really? Slow down. Yes. Let me take notes. Let me start over. Okay, so we live on, yeah. They're really interesting, and um, they have some basic things in common, but ultimately all a planet is, is a means of turning dust and gas and ice into an object. It's a large chemical processing engine. That's what a planet is. And in some cases, and we don't really understand how many or why, you end up with trees and squirrels and blue sky. <laughs> um, but if you take Venus, for example, we think it started off essentially the same, and you have self-cleaning oven temperatures, and precious the equivalent of 900 meters under the ocean on Earth. So we don't really know all the, the details yet as to how you might start off with relatively similar stuff that ends up vastly different. But we're learning. We're learning. Now, now tell me something. Could, could we scare people and say there is a chance that if you push Earth too far, you could end up with a Venus-style scenario? I actually, I think it's probably almost certainly that Venus, that Earth will turn into Venus. I think it's probably oh, no. inevitable. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's what won't do it. Human-driven <laughs> climate change will not do it. There is, as I understand it, there is there are not enough fossil fuels in the ground that we could access and burn fast enough to drive the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere up to what, trigger what's called a runaway greenhouse, which is the phenomenon we think affected Venus, which is the idea that, because we have greenhouse gases, that's what CO2 is, water is a greenhouse gas, Methane is greenhouse gas, but these are gases that basically trap long wavelength radiation from emitting back into space. And so there's a net increase in temperature over time. We're, the reason we think that has happened for Venus, actually, we don't know why. And some of the most foundational questions for Venus we have is we don't know why and we don't know when. 
And actually for Venus, we have two leading hypotheses. And this gets exactly to your question. Basically, one possibility is that Venus was always ruined. It was always a hellhole, <laughs> literally in figures. <laughs> that it started off sufficiently close to the sun that all the heat it, that planets we think have anyway when they form, there's so much energy involved. There's so much heat from impacts and the very act of being born in the first place that Venus was too close to the sun, getting too much solar radiation to ever cool down enough to be able to condense what we assume is a steam-rich atmosphere, we assume that for a variety of reasons, to the point where you could have things like liquid water on the surface. And that was purely because of how close it was to the sun. That's, that's scenario A, in which case Earth clearly escaped that because we were farther away, sunlight wasn't as bright, and therefore we were okay. Um, the problem is the sun is brightening through time. It's getting mm. brighter and, and putting in more radiation. That's what these stars do until, and that's, that's why it's still on the main sequence. That's before it starts to go into Nova. And so the thinking is that within the next few hundred million years, the temperature will slowly inexorably start to rise or just continue to rise separate to what humans are doing, right? Humans are, we are not going to destroy the planet. We are going to destroy our own civilization if we keep going, because we've evolved as a species in the last since the Ice Age, at least technologically and societally, in in very clement conditions. Um, Earth has not always been as clement as it is now, but at the same time, uh, Venus, the, the the brightening star, is going to change things quite a bit, and the surface temperature will get hotter and hotter, and eventually, the thinking is it will trigger what's called a moist greenhouse effect where suddenly there'll be a lot more water vapor in the atmosphere. And that, that sort of exacerbates things, becomes a positive feedback. And eventually then you reach this triggering point where you go into this runaway greenhouse. And so it, we can reasonably expect that, say, within about a billion years or so, although we don't exactly know precisely when, the oceans will boil and we'll eventually lose our oceans. Uh, that will shut down plate tectonics, which is actually the dominant mechanism Earth has of cooling and regulating its climate. And then certainly within the next billion and a half years or so, Earth will probably be functionally sterile, at least all but perhaps some small little refuges in the subterranean environment or maybe at high altitudes in the clouds. But basically, yes, the sun is going to turn, and certainly by 5 billion years' time, when the sun is sloughing off its outer shells and it's turned to a red giant, whether it swallows Earth or not, it's going to completely sterilize the planet and burn it to a crisp. Happy days, right? So we are definitely going to look like <laughs> Venus in about a billion years, just by virtue of what the sun does. That's what stars do. Only a billion? Yeah. Oh, we're yeah. fine. Ooh. We've got time. No, but that, that's, you know, <laughs> I was, I was hoping much. to live to a billion and 50. Well, you could, but you'd be watching least. this from your space orbital or whatever weird oh, yeah, that, you know, okay. ethereal <laughs> plane we've evolved to, right? This, is, of course, is if you decide to not inject the sun with more energy. I, I mean, let's not, I don't know what technologically you could do to stop this. I'm sure you could do something. <laughs> um, but naturally, left alone, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. And, and, it, and it makes the case that Earth has not always been the way it is now. And that's even if you study mm. geology as I do. Um, most, certainly much of the rocks we have access to are rocks that go back the last few hundred million years. Complex life has been on, on Earth as we have it in the rock record for a little bit over half a billion years. That's an extremely long period of time, especially when you consider that modern humans are a few hundred thousand years old. But it's not that long for a planet. Like 500 million years is a ninth the age of a planet, right? So for a long time, Earth was not habitable. At least we don't think it was, or at least we don't know for sure that it was. Yeah, And it's Actual habitable conditions have changed quite a bit through time. And so maybe a billion years, you know, it's kind of sad to think the planet may have a life expectancy of 10 billion years, but it may only be Earth-like for two or three billion of those years. It's not guaranteed any more time than that. And that kind of speaks to a broader issue, the fact that habitability is probably a, a, a matter of timing as much as anything That's else. A fleeting thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably it is. And we can come back to yeah. that. Now, I want to come back to the first part of Matt's question, which is, which is, is it possible we could turn to Venus? So I said the scenario one, is that Venus started off ruined, and we're mm. going to go that way. No problem. Yeah. Scenario two is more interesting, and it's kind of more catastrophic. And it's my preferred one, but we don't have Ooh, evidence either way, either way for the two. Scenario two, B, is that basically Venus, yes, it was closer to the sun, and yes, there's a lot of accretional energy and radiogenic energy, and it was hot very early on. But it was able to somehow, possibly through a hemisphere-scale cloud, it was somehow able to cool down enough. And once the thinking goes, it cools down enough that you can condense that steam, which we presume most planets had a steam rich atmosphere early on, water steam. Uh, if you can condense that stuff out, you can start to pond that steam into 
lakes and seas and you start to make an ocean and you start to get an atmosphere. It's probably a CO2 dominated atmosphere, lots of nitrogen, probably a little bit of methane. There's certainly no free oxygen because that happened much later. But it's relatively okay. Liquid water is stable at the surface. Things are modestly clement. And the idea holds then that once that happens, and if Venus is able to get out and survive those, those tumultuous early years, it probably is going to have to develop a way to regulate its climate temperature. And the way Earth does that is through plate tectonics. There's a thing we call the carbon silicate cycle. You lock carbon into physical form in minerals, and then you subduct those minerals through plate tectonics into the interior. And that's a way of drawing down carbon from the atmosphere in a way that sequesters it and prevents it building up to the point where you trigger a runaway greenhouse. So it's possible if... Venus was able to escape these early days. It too probably had something similar to plate tectonics that allowed it to regulate its temperature by the sequestering somehow of carbon and other greenhouse gases. And then something changed. And that's where you know, we reach a point where there's really only a few planetary phenomena we can invoke to explain the possibility that you take potentially a climate world and turn it into Venus. And the best thing, this is the basis of some modeling work that's come out in the last two years or so. And we can test all this. But what's really interesting is that there at least is the possibility, these models allow for the possibility that catastrophic volcanic eruptions that happen to coincide with one another. So we've, we've had massive catastrophic volcanic eruptions in Earth's history. The most dramatic mass extinction in Earth history that we can see recorded in the fossil record is the Permian-Triassic boundary PT extinction event, which is at least largely, if perhaps not wholly, because of massive volcanic eruptions in Siberia, in what is now Siberia. Uh, many other mass extinction events, there's five large ones, mass extinction events recognized in the rock record. Most of them are associated with some amount of volcanism. Some of them are also associated with impacts like the KT boundary, the the, the Cretaceous, now that the tertiary boundary where um, the dinosaurs got wiped out, the, at least the Saurian dinosaurs got wiped out. I, <laughs> I learned, I was told recently, in fact, the dinosaurs did not go extinct. The avian dinosaurs remained and evolved, but the Saurians went extinct, probably. And sharks. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that, you know, certainly volcanoes can be, they can be givers of life. They can produce fertile soil. And a lot of people live on volcanoes and the volcanic soil is very rich, nutrient rich, but they can also destroy and they can do so at modestly small scales. So we saw the Tonga eruption, which is catastrophic and set up blue a tsunami across the Pacific Basin. Um, Pinatubo, Krakatoa, Mount St. Helens. But you can have planet scale effects by and sustained planet scale effects if you have what are called large igneous provinces. And that's what Siberia is. It's what the Deccan traps in India are, and which some people have linked to the, the KT boundary. Um, but the point is that when these eruptions go off, volcanoes produce a lot of gases, they produce water and they produce sulfur dioxide, which is an ice house gas. And they produce CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. And so volcanoes over the short term, over the year, the month to year time frame, can actually cool the planet because of SO2. But it doesn't last that long in the atmosphere, it gets broken down by sunlight. CO2 lasts a lot longer. And really what it comes down to is that you end up with a situation where you can dump a lot of CO2 very quickly, potentially faster than you can draw it down again. And so there is at least a, a modeled scenario under which Venus survives the early days, manages to be Earth-like for a time, and then has several large igneous provinces go off at the same time. Now, we do not understand what governs these things or necessarily what controls when or where they go off. They aren't really obviously associated with plate boundaries. Some people have suggested there's some kind of link there. They appear to be relatively regular. Most of them are modest enough. That they produce local extinctions, but they also produce new land where they can produce a whole pile of new nutrients to the sea or the water. So they're part of a natural life cycle of Earth. But if you, if you happen to have several at one time, which potentially could happen, and it might be an entirely stochastic thing, an entirely random thing, then it's it's not beyond the realm's possibility that Venus might have been Earth-like, meaningfully Earth-like. And then it was subject to the eruption of several of these large igneous provinces simultaneously. And that's a push into a runaway greenhouse effect. And if that's true, and I'm I'm placing if upon if upon if, these are all model <laughs> scenarios that, that we need to go to Venus to test. Bedrocks of ifs. Which we're going to do exactly. And mm. Yeah, this, the, the rock basement of this model is very, very deep. <laughs> yeah. But it does mean that there is, it, A, is something we can test, but B, it, it kind of speaks to the fact that it may not be so straightforward to understand the life cycle of the history of the planet if something like this can happen. And it may be that perhaps Venus was unlucky to have had several of these go off at one time and overwhelm its ability to, to draw down the carbon. Or perhaps Earth has been lucky that at least so mm. far it hasn't had these. We don't know. 
And so that's one of the things that we're going to test with the set of missions that NASA and the European Space Agency picked last summer, that actually for the first time in 30 years, the United States is going to go back to Venus, equipped with the technology to actually answer or start to answer some of these questions. In that second scenario, Earth could quite rapidly become like Venus if you had this incredibly unlucky... Set rapidly of, with strong quotes. Yeah, rapidly, rapidly, rapid, geologically. Yeah. But geologically rapidly, absolutely could. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, the, the definition of... Um, I mean, it changes sometimes, but my understanding of the current definition of the large igneous province is uh, 100,000 square kilometers of resurfacing or 100,000 cubic kilometers of erupted lava in, in a relatively short period of time, I think 10 million years. You know, that's that's not a crazy amount per day. It, compared to like normal rates, it is. But, you know, you could go and you could visit it. But, yeah. but 10 million years is, is extremely long for, for a species. A species could rise and fall in the time one of these things is going off. What, what, what does one of these things look like? If I, if I was to visit one, what, what, what kind of thing would I see today then? If I, um, is well, it like so, the Icelandic one? I mean, you, there was uh, earlier this year, there was this uh, uh, Icelandic volcano and it was so cool to see those images of people like mm -hmm. just kind of taking pictures of the lava as it's rushing yep. towards them, but, you know, rushing as much as a slow yes. moving lava can rush. And, and thankfully that kind of lava typically moves relatively slow. In fact, it may destroy yeah. buildings and infrastructure, but typically you can, it doesn't kill many people. You can typically. walk away from it. <laughs> you can walk away from it. Now, in some cases you can. There are times, there's yeah. footage from the 2018 eruption on Kilauea. Sometimes mm. lavas, lavas are actually very good, particularly when they're flowing on relatively flat land. They're very good at basically building up levees. They build up margins. Think of the things you have in bowling alleys. If you suck at bowling, yeah. right, right, you right. put those things up like little buffers. And, and lava can do that, and it's sort of thermally insulated, and that means the interior flow can go really fast, like bullet train Right, fast. like a funnel, kind of. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Now, uh, that, you know, that, that's contingent on a bunch of things, too. And certainly if it's on a slope, yeah. it helps that it's going downhill a bit. Sure. Um, but yeah, but the thing in Iceland, no, the thing in Iceland is nothing, nothing. Volumetrically, <laughs> these things are pathetic. They look amazing, yeah. but these individual volcanoes never contribute much by way of like crustal volume. Whereas these sure. LIPs are big. So if you want to go see what they look like, and also the thing is that they aren't, we think, we've never seen one erupt, thank God. But yeah. they're not really necessarily, at the beginning, they might be associated with individual discrete edifices. But most of the time, what they do is they produce this vast plains of lava, which, by the way, separately but relatedly, is the dominant mode of volcanism on most planets. Most places, mm. it's big plains of lava. It's not little cones. Cool. But the point is that um, if you want to see what this looks like, go to the Deccan Traps in India. Traps is a word, I think it's, a, it's an Icelandic word used to describe the sort of staircase pattern of this stuff when it's eroded. I mean, there's right. lots of places. There's the Columbia River basalts in the northwest of the United States. There's the Kerguelen Plateau, which I've done work on. In fact, most ocean islands happen to be miniature versions of these. And the reason they're called traps is because the lava comes out in layers. Sometimes individual flows often as big packets of lava. Yeah, and there could yeah. be there could be seasons or years between the next one. There are often what are called paleo sols between them, which sure. you, sometimes you can see you know, grass and stuff. You can see seasons of growth and then the next packet of lava yeah. comes out because it's not like if it's erupting for a million years, geologically, of course, it's nothing. But that's not like nothing in terms of time. So this is going to go for a right. while and it might be another 10,000 years before the next one comes out, but integrated over a short period of time, it's a lot of lava and a lot of gas. But if you go to the Deccan Traps, for example, where, you know, and you've got such a humid environment there, it is an awful lot of erosion and you end up with these valleys kilometers deep and you can see all the way down the, the, the walls of the valleys, this sort of sta staircase or terraced pattern where you're eroding down through this stack of lavas in place geologically yeah. quickly. Same with the Siberian yeah. Traps, which are the biggest... Uh, what we call sub-aerial, meaning like on land, under the air, yeah. exposure of these things anywhere that I think anywhere on Earth recognized on Earth. Wow. And there's some really big ones uh, on submarine ones on the ocean floor as well. And the reason these things matter is, A, yeah, they resurface a whole pile of land and, you know, they'll destroy forests and there'll be forest fires, which of course can also contribute to putting uh, carbon to the atmosphere and soot and embers, which drive more forest fires. You see similar things with large impacts. But by far the most damaging thing these things do in terms of climate and ecosystem is the introduction of huge volumes of gas, CO2 into the atmosphere that are going to be, and, and water vapor that are both greenhouse gases. Injecting this stuff into the sea carbonates the sea. It turns the sea into carbonic acid, or at the very least, yeah. it, it decreases its pH. That has implications for things like little crawlies in the sea that build their shells out of calcium carbonate. They have a harder time, the carbon cal the calcium carbonate compensation depth changes and the actual depth to which these things say that the, 10 times really fast i, I will not <laughs> um, but 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 the, but the portion of the ocean where these things live you know is decreased and so that has a you know that puts a lot of pressure on on, on the ecolo ecological systems too so these things can be really big deals but but if you saw them you would see you know an eroded version is just stacks of lava going down thousands yeah. of meters 
Just so it's really more out. about the gas that's being released, and that's having a lot. It's not that there's scary volcanoes like, oh no, we're all getting killed off by v- Vesuvian volcanoes. It's more that right. they're actually, releasing actually they're gas that has a long-term explosive. impact. Exactly. Like right, right. Vesuvius is a, is a particular volcano associated with the subduction zone. Those volcanoes typically happen to have uh, water-enriched melt or magma, yeah. and that typically makes that magma more explosive. And so actually, typically mm. with volcanoes cool. associated with subduction zones, they tend to explode like the Hunga Tonga eruption. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, earlier and so in the case of Vesuvius yeah you you pyroclastic ash think the movie Volcano uh, and the movie uh, Dante's Peak Um, Uh uh-huh but the bottom line is is good band name it's an amazing band name but but, you know (laughs) as bad as they are they tend to have fairly local effects Mm. exploding volcano might wipe out a city or might do a huge amount of damage to a forest so so how isn't there yeah so how yeah why is there no disaster movie with these with these vast with these tiny little ones like (laughs) Like big, big <laughs> lava, you know, because yeah, it sounds well, so, like it's... Uh, two reasons. I think one is um, the imagination of Hollywood r- writers. Um, you know, <laughs> there's no reason you couldn't have this. But the other thing too is it is difficult to convey the idea that you could have a planet killing or at least a climate killing event that transcends. I mean, as bad as anthropogenic climate change is, which is real and it's happening and it's us, and we need to stop it. As bad as that is, yes, that is not going to trigger the kind of thing we see in, that Venus has undergone. It may yeah. destroy, you know, half of the population of Earth's easy access to food and water security and housing, but it's not going to uh, sterilize the crust. Um, right. But at the same time, it is kind of hard to convey the idea that like, it also might happen on human time scales very, very slowly. Yeah. You know, like I said, I you could be living for 10,000 years and be throughout that entire time only put out 1% of a large igneous province. So in other words, you yeah. would consider this normal behavior. Yeah. I'm always so blown away with both how much we don't know and how much we do know about the things like Mars and Venus like that. Because, you know, my, my, my naive understanding is that a lot of the things we know about the geological history of Earth is because we physically look at the rocks, you know, we drill and we yeah. see cleavages and we, you know, we can see the sort of think uh, high school geo- or geology chemistry textbook where you see the different layers of mm-hmm. the different rocks. But I mean, how do we know all of these things about Venus and Mars? I know we have rovers that I guess drill, but they can't be drilling deep enough to see the no. whole geological history of the planet. So how how do we how do we know this? Is it good guesses? Or yeah, well, so that's a great question, and and the bottom line is we don't really. We have often <laughs> consistent, internally consistent <laughs> models, right? Yeah. We yeah. don't even know Earth's geological history all that well. Right, like you say, right. We can drill, but but the, deep, the deepest we've ever drilled, I think the deepest hole was a Soviet drilled hole. I don't remember when, but I think it went down like seven miles, like 11 kilometers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in nothing, some places, yeah. the cross is 40 kilometers deep. And then you get, you know, the yeah. mantle is always another... T- 3,000 kilometers or something. Okay. I mean, it's interpretations, right? It's like a bit like yeah. reading um, ancient Greek poetry. We think yeah, this is it, it is similar. And honestly, a lot of geology is sort of piecing together. One of the best skills you learn as a geoscientist is being able to take often totally disparate data sets that are often badly incomplete and trying to basically synoptically put them together and make sense of what you see. It's very hard yeah. to test some of these things. And certainly some of the, like, the thing that kind of staggers me, and this is where other planets actually are really beneficial, is that on Earth, when you have, there's two kinds of crusts on Earth. There's continental crust, which is the stuff we live on, and there's oceanic crust. Continental crust, once you make it, pretty much stays around. But it gets reworked and covered in stuff, sediments and lavas and soil and well, buildings. Yeah, and Roman so coins. There's extremely, very, very few parts of it left, right? They're individual mineral grains is all that's left of the original crust on Earth, the original continental crust that, that we think might have been present very early in the planet's life, Min- individual zircon grains we found in Australia. So we know virtually nothing. We have to infer an enormous amount about what Earth looked like. The oceans aren't any better. The oldest oceanic crust on Earth is, is about 200 million years old because that's how long it takes in the longest case for new crust to be made at what we call a spreading center where oceanic plate is made and it gets conveyed thanks to plate tectonics, to what we call a subduction zone where it dives back in and helps bring a bunch of carbon with it, keep the planet regulated. So the point is that most 95% of Earth history is gone. It's been buried or destroyed or eroded or otherwise inaccessible or subducted. So we have very, very little information about ancient Earth. And the cool thing about looking at the planets is, with the exception of Venus, which is complicated and, and worth a whole episode on its own, in the case of Mars and Moon and Mercury, 
some of the oldest crust in the solar system is still preserved because not that much happens there, relatively speaking. And certainly there are parts right. of Mars that are many billion, there are 4.7 billion years old, the moon Mercury. And for example, just to give you one obvious example that people can relate to, if you look at the moon, the full moon, I love how Lynn, you just looked up. I don't know, is the moon, I know it's nighttime, but is the moon up there right <laughs> now? Or, or was no, I just, like, I just, I just see clouds. I'm in Sweden. Okay. I don't know where the moon is. Or you. It might be below you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, so think of the moon, right? And on the bit that we can see, and we can always see one side of the moon, it's tidally locked. That's a whole mm-hmm, different conversation. Mm-hmm. There's darker bits and there's brighter bits. Now, first yes. off, I want to make the point this, and this is something I think a lot of people don't know. The moon is not bright. The moon looks bright, but the moon is basically the color of like coal or maybe dark charcoal, pencil. The light stuff is that color. Really? I and the lava lighter. is even darker. And the wow. reason it looks bright is because it has nothing it's competing with against the night sky. But if That's you were to fair. put, there's a, there's a moon of Saturn called Enceladus, which is made of ice. Many of the moons in the outer solar system have an ice covering, an ice shell. And its ice is so pure that its albedo, which is the amount of sunlight that it reflects, is like more than 90%. Its albedo is 0.9 something. If you put Enceladus at the same distance to Earth, at the distance to Earth, such that it was the same size in the sky as the moon, mm-hmm. it's much smaller than the moon. Yeah. It would be so bright at night that it'd be like being in a football stadium with floodlights. What? Oh, wow. We would have no darkness, basically, if we had That's a moon. That's my like favorite fact of the day. Yeah. What, oh. So what's the albedo of the moon? Just ballpark? It's point 0.3 or point 0.2 something. It's really? this big moon's been lying to you all the time. And the beautiful oh moon, look how bright it is. It's dark gray. <laughs> it's just that you're looking at it against like oblivion. That's why it looks duped. bright. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. you know, I, yeah, I work with planets. So I, 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 I did not know that the moon was so. I, I, t- <laughs> I, I tell you what, that it, when you get when you see really nice astrophotography and they've they've mm-hmm. they've got that contrast on the moon yes. and it looks that kind of dark soily color. Uh huh. It's that's when it that's when you c- kind of looks realistic. So I yeah. kind yeah, of guess exactly. that that's where usually the moon gets the Kardashian treatment. It just looks. Like yeah, it just does. It does. <laughs> and if you look at the Apollo photographs, often like you see. You know the moon is relatively brightly lit, but and, yeah. that, and people are all like, "Well, how come it's fake? Because there's no stars." You're like, well, the reason well, there's no stars is because your your exposure setting is such that if you saw the right, stars, right, right. the black the front would be black, and mm-hmm. you wouldn't see the astronauts. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's yeah, that's setting. true. Actually, when I think about the pictures of the astronauts on the moon, like they're sort of whitish. Yeah, they're bright. That is the yeah. The yeah, moon yeah. is not bright, and if you ask them, yeah. you can listen to what they say on their transcripts. They're like, it's quite dark. You know, and, but they also went to the to the to the side facing us during the lunar day, so that they would be right, able to direct right. communication with Earth anyway, so that they could see where they're going. Yeah. Because you walk, there's no atmosphere to refract or scatter light. So if you walk around a boulder into the shadow, it's pitch yeah. black until you get into it and you let your eyes adjust. Yeah, because there'll, there'll be some scattered light, but but not much. So, it, so if you scoop up a, a lunar sample, put it in your pocket, and and go back home and pull it out in your living room, like. What, you what stain color? it yeah it'll be it's something like why who drag car- charcoal in here it's not quite that dark but it's dark <laughs> yeah yeah, 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 it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, like it's concrete like kind of yeah yeah exactly yeah. it's not bright anyway so i'm bringing up the moon because despite the fact that it's dark we've been lying to you the whole time and um, it, it has it has darker splotches and right. they are what we call the lunar maria which is originally derived from the latin for the word sea hmm. i don't actually know if in real life anyone ever thought it was ocean but they were named for sea so there's a sea of tranquility sea of crisis sea of whatever and the idea basically is that that stuff is lava but the stuff around the the rest of the moon the lighter stuff is is a different kind of material it doesn't really matter what it is it's called flotation cross we can get into that if you guys want but the idea basically is that that darker stuff is lava and there is a very good reason why many of the splotches are sort of quasi-circular And that's because they are gigantic impact basins that stuff is flooded into. Now, the lava is younger than the basin. So it's not like the basin happened and then the lava formed. But the reason this is important is because there are some staggeringly huge impact basins on the moon. I mean, really, really big, you know, a thousand kilometer cross basin. Basin is so big that if you consider the curvature of the moon itself, the basin floor, which is flat, is actually curved. Right, the gravity mm. gradient is flat, but it is in fact curved because that's how big the, plant, the, the, the base it is. So Mercury has giant basins and Mars has giant impact basins and the moon has giant impact basins. Now, Venus is a separate conversation. It's, got, it's more complicated. But the point is that neither Venus nor Earth have today, but there's no reason to think that the moon got whacked in these catastrophically giant impact events and somehow yeah. Earth didn't. And so what that tells right. us, for example, is you can look at 
a preserved record of early solar system history when you look at the moon and you look at where those those lavas have ponded. Those yeah. basins must have been on Earth, but they've been covered up or buried or healed or subducted yeah. since then. So it's an example of you can you see look at very early Earth history by simply staring at the moon, in, in a manner of speaking. And that's and guess, what's real powerful about comparing planets. Yeah. And I guess, I, I mean, the moon surely formed from probably some impact event with Earth. So I guess they're also sort of geologically similar enough that you can anticipate that they would sort of act similarly yeah, to, exactly. you know, being destroyed. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually something that came out of the Apollo mission, was that because for there were four leading hypotheses for how the moon is, why the moon yeah. is the moon. And one of them is that it was captured. And it turns out that's yeah. actually really hard to explain. But one of the things that was really surprising was that we saw from the samples that the Apollo astronauts brought back is that chemically the moon is in some ways identical to Earth. Yeah. Now, in many other yeah, ways, it's not, yeah, but there are I've some heard. isotopes are the same. Sure. And that seems extremely unlikely, unless yeah. they were made of the same stuff originally. And that led to this idea that we have what's called the, the, the giant impact hypothesis or giant impact collision hypothesis, that at some point very early on in baby Earth, which was not yeah. smaller, but, but much younger and molten on the exterior, an object yeah. about the size Young of Mars hot. that's called Theia smashed into it. And disrupted yeah. Earth and produced a huge ring of material, and ultimately that ring coalesced into the Moon. Mm. And most most of the core of Theia merged with Earth's core to form what is now Earth. Um, th this is still a hypothesis, but it's the best one to explain the data we have to hand. But it is worth saying briefly that so we have this giant impact scenario for Earth that produces this big Moon. Mercury, if you consider how big Mercury is, if you were to cut Mercury in half. The outer mm. rocky part, so the crust and the mantle together, is only about 420 yeah. kilometers. If oh, you wow. stand on the surface of Mercury, you get to the core 420 kilometers down. On Earth, it's like yeah. three and a half thousand kilometers. So most yeah. of most of Mercury is core. It's li molten liquid iron. Just a big. That's basically what Mercury is—a big iron ball bearing wrapped in a thin blanket of rock. Yeah, yeah. It's, we don't really know why that is, and one possibility is that Mercury was originally bigger. And perhaps mm. it had a core more in proportion to what we see Mars and Earth have, and even the Moon. Mm. And something hit it very early on, or maybe multiple things hit it and stripped away yeah. an outer layer. Now, that's just one possibility, but that's mm. that's potentially giant impact happening there. Venus yeah. rotates backwards. It moves around the sun the same way we do, but it rotates on its own axis backwards. People have proposed a giant impact as responsible. Uranus is on its side, right? Mm -hmm. It's axial tilt is at 98 degrees. Um, so it's pole, rotational pole face, it's sounds weird. And the upper, the upper third of Mars topographically is lower than the rest of the planet. Yeah. And that has led to some people proposing the upper hemisphere of Mars is a single giant impact base, the biggest in the solar system. So these are all hypotheses. We haven't established any of this for fact, although I think the lunar hypothesis collision thing is probably the strongest one. But they yeah. all kind of speak to the possibility that not just did you gi produce giant impact bases, but you really, really whacked planets very early on. <laughs> And, and this, the benefit of, of studying other planets and comparing them and contrasting them to, to, to each other and to Earth is that you start to build up this idea that what Earth is today is by no means reflective of what it was a billion years ago, two billion years ago, certainly not what history was like early in the solar system. Such that if we saw a photo of Earth in its infancy, we certainly wouldn't recognize it. It didn't have continents, yeah. certainly yeah. didn't have them in the arrangement we have today. It had a Parts of the surface were probably glowing. It had large impact bases. It may have had circular seas mm. where water had filled in these depressions, but it looked nothing like it did today. And it kind of speaks yeah. things are only a matter of timing, you know, that if you jump forward a billion years, Earth will look different again. It may not be blue anymore. I, I'm, I'm right in saying that because NASA have got a mission out to Psyche, haven't they? And Psyche is another one of these yeah, that's right. potential planetary cores. That's right. Yeah. So Psyche, we think, is a metal rich asteroid. Now, the amount of metal that we that we think makes up Psyche 16 is it's not quite clear. The amount has been changing through time as people get more telescope time ahead of the mission. It's now yeah. possible because, of course, usually the measurements lead to kind of bounding estimates rather than a particular number. But it's certainly possible that it might be mainly metal, but it might be maybe half metal, half rock. But but our still our leading hypothesis is that, yeah, it's a protoplanetary core. Uh, an object that got big enough that it was able to undergo a process we call differentiation, which is the same concept as you imagine. I, I, the way I teach this is you take a test tube or, or anything, a beaker and you put sand and water in there and you shake them. 
and you'll get this mix of stuff, right? But over a few minutes, because of differences in buoyancy, the sand will sink and the water rises and they separate. And that's basically a process of differentiation. All the heavy metals and stuff. Go. In fact, right, right. you've heard of the phrase like rare earth elements. You have things like palladium and platinum. They're yeah. not rare. The things in your phone. <laughs> the things in your phone, things we need for batteries and catalytic converters and you name it. They're not rare in terms of bulk earth. But most yeah. of that stuff is in the core, Right. And very oh, little is in the sense. crust. Okay. That's why it's called rare earth, as in like the dirt on the top. Mm. Uh-huh. And, and 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 that that gets because that stuff, all the heavy metals sank. You know, the majority of it is nickel and iron, but but most of it is yeah. all the heavy stuff. Most of the heavy stuff sank, which is why, by the way, asteroids are so interesting from a mining perspective because most asteroids, not all, but most of them, were too small to undergo this process of differentiation. Which means the heavy stuff and the expensive, valuable stuff is as mixed on the upper portion of it as it is in the interior portion. Which means you could land there and gobble up the ground and however you you would process stuff, um, and actually be able to do that much cheaper than having to go dig it out of the core of a planet. So it sounds like there's so much that could have happened in the early history of the solar system. But my question is then, so if we know now that there's obviously been so many things that will have happened over the last few billions of years since the planets all formed and, you know, they, some planets got knocked over, some are going backwards, some have impact basins, but how dissimilar do you think that they were? Day one, I mean, the, 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 when they first became, they went from planetesimals to planets. So once they became big enough that we consider them, okay, this is now, you know, this is not just proto Venus or early Venus. This is now Venus. Back then, how how dissimilar would say Mars, Earth, and Venus have been? In you know, were their formation processes similar? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm going to preface all my answers by saying I don't know. But you know what? Like, <laughs> None of us all, all things being equal, yeah, probably they were they were similar. Um, we don't know. Yeah. But it has been proposed that because, like I said earlier, volcanism produces prodigious amounts of gas. Mm. Um, there, there's, wait, there's, are there volcanoes on Venus and Mars? Oh, boy, are there volcanoes. On, on, oh. The biggest <laughs> volcano we know of in the solar system Oh, sure, yeah, of course, Mars, Venus. Yeah, yeah. Mons. And Venus is a planet that, I, I mean, I've I've got on record saying this many times. I'll say it again. We have no <laughs> direct evidence for volcanism on Venus, but I would Uh-oh. bet any amount of money that not only are there volcanoes. Well, we know there are volcanoes on Venus. We don't have any evidence that yeah. it's volcanically active right now. Right. I right. am. I am convinced, as much as I can be, about anything that in fact yeah. Venus is volcanically active right now. Right now, and we get Mars quakes, right? Yeah, you get Mars quakes. Mars is boring. Listen, Mars is like is, yeah, is this whole <laughs> cold thing that burned down. Yeah, and people get excited about liquid water on the surface, sure. And I Venus agree. may never have had anything like that. It may always have been terrible, mm-hmm. but Venus may have had oceans. There may have been Venus whales. We don't know that yet. The way we <gasps> test that is we go and we measure uh, specific isotopes of, of particular gases in the Venus atmosphere, which is what mm-hmm. a mission that was selected last year called Da Vinci is going to do, a NASA mission called Da Vinci, mm-hmm. um, later this decade. Because it turns out by measuring noble gases, you can actually infer a lot about what the inventory of planets' history is and what, what it was born with and what it lost. Um, but in terms of how they started off early on, th- there's, there's two things that govern whether you have an atmosphere. And I'm simplifying here. One is, how big are you? Like, what's your, your gravity, your mass? And the other is, how far or close are you to your star? And basically what it comes down to is, you imagine, you know, gas molecules and you know atoms come out. And they're physical objects. They have mass. And if you are relatively small, and therefore your gravity field is relatively weak, and or you're relatively close to the sun, which is particularly in its early life, putting out a huge amount of extreme UV radiation, but even now putting out a lot of solar wind, you have a really hard time holding on to real light elements like helium and hydrogen. Sure. They're gone. They're gone. If you, if you, are, here. If you are big and or far away, it becomes mm-hmm. easier to hold on to gases. And certainly in the case of the really big bodies, like Jupiter and Saturn, the reason like they Jupiter, are yeah, right. helium hydrogen rich is because it's a combination of they are both massive, they were able to mm. hold on to that hydrogen envelope, and they're yeah. far from the sun. They're not that much assailed by the solar wind. Yeah. Earth has no, it's not nearly big enough to hold on to hydrogen or helium at the distances of the mm. sun, but it is clearly able to hold on to things like H2O and O2 and nitrogen, right? right? So right. it really comes down to how big you are and and and, and basically how cold you are or, or how close you are to the sun. And I guess magnetic field as well, right? Because I think... Ba- that, no, yeah. and this nah. gets really ooh, ooh. complicated. <gasps> oh, okay, I'm wrong. Really Whoa, hold so, on yeah. to your hats. Oh, this, this is interesting. Okay, okay. Oh, we're, we're taking another diversion. I'm trying to remember to go back hot. to the previous path I was yeah. on. Okay. It was a turn yeah, okay, okay. previous question. But anyway, yeah. Venus... <laughs> we're in the seventh circle here. <laughs> Venus is no magnetic field. 
and it has an atmosphere 90 times more dense than Earth. Oh my God, that's true. So tell me why magnetic field is necessary for, for holding onto an atmosphere. In fact, oh we, now God, know, we now know with pretty big error bars that the rate uh -huh. at which Venus is losing its atmosphere is about the same as the rate at which Earth is losing its atmosphere, which is about the same the rate at which Mars is losing its atmosphere. And the canonical story we, we've been told, right, is that basically Mars's magnetic field shuts down. That surely probably played a role, but it's probably way mm -hmm. more complicated than that. And I'm beginning to form the view, I think we are kind of moving as a community towards the view that at least in part, what matters is not just how you're losing it and the rate at which you're losing it. Can you replenish it? Right. And the atmosphere comes from volatiles inside lava which in turn comes from melting the planet's interior. So mm. if a planet's huh. big and or volatile rich, meaning it had a lot of this, like 98% of Earth's water is locked in hydroxyl molecules in the mantle. Yeah. Like, it's just a thin scum of stuff on the outside. It's what we call our oceans. And talking <laughs> of scummy, like thin layer, yeah. average ocean depth on Earth is like five kilometers, right? But there's an ocean under, we think, Ganymede's ice shell that's 900 kilometers deep, right? So... <laughs> Like, you know those movies where the aliens come Imagine flying over that. suck the water out of the planet? They're stupid because yes. if you if you were aliens and you wanted water for some reason and you couldn't somehow synthesize it or gobble up a nebula, you go out to the outer planets. You don't come all the way into the sun's gravity well to this planet. If you're coming to this solar system, like, don't get it from why? Earth. The only reason they're coming here is to eat us. And I don't know why they would do Absolutely. that because presumably they could regenerate artificial meat. Anyway, the point but is <laughs> magnetic fields may not matter. And in fact, recent work has suggested that magnetic fields could even potentially speed up the rate at which you lose your atmosphere. Oh, because oh, I've been because, lying and because you talks. ionize the air and you accelerate it down your magnetic field lines and you actually lose it to space. Uh, right? I've been brilliant. propagating misinformation. Guys, I'm, I'm here to drop the truth bombs on you. Okay, the moon is darker than they've been, than big moons. Yeah. I'm telling you, oh, and this and is big amazing. magnetic big field has big been lying. <laughs> Oh, wait, and, would and, that and, also... And the biggest reason the, the, why Mars doesn't have an atmosphere today may at least in part, perhaps as much matter as... Uh, or what may matter is at least as much as the magnetic field or lack thereof is how much stuff it's able to degas. And if right. it's just ran out of heat early on, you can still generate melt. You can still produce magma, but it just doesn't reach the surface. It's just, it gets stuck inside the, the planet body and, yeah. it, and it may slowly degas up solidly through the solid body, but it's not pumping teratons of stuff into the air. It means that even if Mars, which we know was very volcanically active at some point in its life, I mean, it's not just the big volcanoes, it's these vast lava plains. But it's very likely, I think, personally at least, that the reason Mars has no atmosphere today or barely an atmosphere is much less to do with the magnetic field and much more to the fact that it's able to replenish or it was unable to replenish its atmosphere yeah. through through huge large-scale volcanism, which explains to the fact that even if the rate at which you lose, let's say Mars may have had 1.5 bar atmosphere or where room to pressure is around one bar, and, and now it's six millibars, right? So let's say it's yeah. functionally lost one and a half bars of atmosphere. Earth has one bar of atmosphere, but it's presumably had volcanism going for a long time, its entire life, and therefore probably not challenged by having to replace a bar and a half of lost atmosphere. And Venus is 90 bars. It won't notice if it loses a bar and a half of atmosphere to space because it's like, whatever. Yeah. I've 90 <laughs> left over. Could it also be an argument for maybe Venus and being volcanically active that it is... But, or is it just it has so much atmosphere no one would notice? But how the but but it's like why does it have so much atmosphere? Where does that atmosphere come from? It's yeah. not so what, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let 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 cut some Mister Thicky here. But what on <laughs> earth? What 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 causes volcanic activity in the first place? You know what? How is could it you know the core? That, yeah. So what what's yeah? So what what is it about the cause that's causing this volcanic activity? Right, so this, why this, would it stop? Why would it pause? Why okay. would it? Yeah. Okay. So there's there's two things that govern how much. So volcanism comes from, and I'm going to use the term volcanism to kind of capture both the intrusive and extrusive stuff. Sometimes volcanism we use not necessarily volcan just volcanoes, just the stuff that's on the surface, exactly. Right. So, so you know, igneous processes, right, producing sure. melt, magma genesis. Um, there's, there's, there's two things. One is, um, well, there's, there's two primary sources of heat. There's how much heat you're born with, and then there's how much heat you have in terms of radiogenic element decay. Now, one might reasonably start from the perspective that all things being equal, which they're not, the protoplanetary disk might have been chemically similar. And therefore, Mercury, Mars, Earth, and then Moon, Venus started off with broadly comparable compositions. For a long time, people thought it's probably not true. More recent work has suggested that, in fact, it might be certainly a paper in Italy last week was suggesting that Earth was born with most of its water. That every two years now, there's a paper coming out saying basically this, whereas we used to think there was a veneer of comets at the end. Now I think we're kind of moving towards the idea that probably the overall bulk abundance of the planets are probably largely the same. 
which stands to reason, by the way, it means that all things being equal, which they're not, if you get a certain <laughs> amount of volcanism per unit time on Mars, you might expect to get a similar amount on Earth, right? But and Earth's this relates to... And this relates to what we were talking about with the formation process, how different they were in the first place. Right. They all, they may, the, the biggest difference is how big they are. Yeah. But they probably no. functionally, I mean, there's lots of detail I'm skipping. And even small yeah. changes in other uh, uh, elements like carbon, you know, could have a profound yeah. impact upon the geology. But functionally, they're made of magnesium and silicon and oxygen yeah. and iron. Right? And, and they all group together and they start to differentiate. Actually, we know again i'm being grossly oversimplistic here but we know <laughs> the atmos the spectral signatures of the atmospheres of many stars are similar to our own mm-hmm. which means yeah. that the, the most common standard rock you get on earth is called basalt and i can guarantee you there's basalt on a planet a billion light years away it's like the most so generic rock you get yeah. so basically and for our you, planets it's only now that they've kind of turned into the sort of uh wes anderson royal tenenbaum siblings that have all become estranged from each other because of all these unique <laughs> conditions exactly. and we don't know all those unique conditions or how they interplay yeah. and, and that's a big part of what people are doing what we call exoplanetary science trying to understand how, what kinds of exoplanets are there how many are there how, how, what are the different paths the planet can take but just in terms of the atmosphere and the volcanism um you certainly get so if you look at the amount of heat that comes out of the ground overwhelming orders of magnitude of the heat on the ground itself, like you go outside to the, the, the footpath, that's from the sun. Solar radiation overwhelms yeah. anything else, but it only penetrates like this far into the ground. So it has no role geologically in terms of what's driving the interior of the planet. The sun, planet doesn't care, yeah. which means you can have what's called a rogue planet, planet ejected early on from a planetary system it forms in, and it can have all most of the same processes. It just would do so under perpetual night. But in the case of, say, Earth, Earth's mantle, where all those most of those radiogenic elements live, Earth's mantle is huge. It's like 80% of the volume of the planet or something. It's, it's huge. That's a lot of stuff that you can produce heat in to melt. Mars is much, much smaller than Earth, and its mantle is much, much smaller. And its surface area is much greater per volume because of the nature of stuff scaling. Same with Mercury. And what we see in their planetary histories recorded on their surfaces, and one thing I've skipped over is how we can estimate relative times. It has to do with craters, and that really is a conversation for another day. But we can at least build together like you know, a rough framework or a structure to understand the history of each of these worlds, with the exception of Venus, which is really complicated. But even then, we know that relatively recently, it's had a lot of volcanic activity. We know that from the surface in terms of the lava, as we see, and there aren't that many craters, and there are no giant impact basins the way there are on the other worlds. And what that basically says is the reason you're getting volcanism is because you have that leftover heat on earth about half of the heat coming from the ground is leftover heat from when it was born four and a half billion years ago it's still there still warm because it's very well insulated the core is well very well insulated by the mantle and the other half ish is heat coming from the mantle itself as you have the decay of radiogenics and you just have a large planet with a stonkingly big magma or big mantle (laughs) And that's how Earth is able to remain volcanically active. But even then, I've told you about these large igneous provinces. They're pathetically small compared (laughs) to our inferences for how much crust was produced early on. In fact, in the case of Mars, we think most of Mars's crust was produced in 100 million years and probably in the first few tens of millions of years. Meaning that the amount of, like I've described these lavas, these large igneous provinces to you, I want you to actually think biblical when I talk about early crustal production rates on planets where you were talking about resurfacing 10% of the planet, you know, in a few thousand years. Like nothing on Earth, nothing in Earth's record is preserved of that time. We infer it on the basis of what we see on Mars and on Mercury, for example, in particular. And so the idea is that why, why do you have volcanism, let's say, that might be continued today on Venus and on Earth and not on Mars? It's just because they're much, much larger and they've much, much more rated. And the, the actual absolute volume of radiogenics is much higher. That yeah. doesn't mean that Mars isn't volcanically active, by the way. I'm positive Mar- Mars will erupt again. But what probably happens is if you were to graph, I know we, you may not be able to see this, but like if we do uh, amount of stuff coming out of the ground on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, starts off really, really high and then quite quickly, you know, bottoms out. And then for the longest time has almost an asymptotic curve here which is to say that even the volcanism, the rates of volcanism we see on Earth today are, are former, or they're, they're, they're shadows of what they once were. Yeah. Mm. Right? Well, well, so if the radiogenics, all these sort of radioactive particles are in there, so some planets, if they're born in a protoplanetary disk that doesn't have radioactive elements in it. Or at least as many of them, yes. Or as many of yeah. in, in them. Because yep. that mean that they don't really really have the, the kind of vol- 
volcanic activity that our planets do. That's that is essentially the inference, and one of the ways we can try and test that is, you know, people with you know with very advanced telescopes, for example, like James Webb, looking to see if we can get any evidence or information about the planet's atmosphere. Uh, you know, do we see any changes? Did someone in, say in, planetary atmospheres? Yes. So planetary atmospheres are extremely important. I mean, they're just the, I they're, think so. Let's, 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 let's be clear. As, as you look at the size of the planet, it's a very thin. It's like the, the skin of an apple, yeah. right? It's not the bit everyone uh-huh. gets excited about. Okay, the apple, the <laughs> yeah. eating the apple is in the meat. But certainly yes. the atmosphere is important. And particularly for things like life, you know, it, we would not fare so well if we had no atmosphere or if we had a Venus like atmosphere. Um, but, yeah. but, you know, and the interaction between, between atmosphere and, and geology is huge. And, and that's, that's well, where the biosphere covered, you know, that's, that's where the all biosphere the, is. And as we were talking about, about how Venus's atmosphere was was affected by its geology. So absolutely, I mean, there, there's yeah. clear yeah. interplay. It, it, absolutely. And, and, and actually un- unpicking that is extremely important to kind of understand. It's also worth pointing out, by the way, another sidebar, the atmospheres of Venus and Mars are dominantly CO2. Now, the amount of atmosphere is vastly different, but they're both CO2 dominated, which probably mm. tells Uh-oh. us that Earth's early <laughs> atmosphere was CO2 dominated as well. That might be the yeah. standard atmosphere you get as a function of the availability yeah. of carbon and oxygen inside a body as it forms. Um, but to exactly that point, Matt, you know, a big question we have is what, in fact, a lot of work has been done, is being done by people far brighter than I am to try and understand, can you draw any, can you make any prediction of the composition of, a, of an exoplanet on the basis of what its star is made of, which we can tell on the basis of its yeah. spectra? And uh, the short yeah. answer is, is the, 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 the very short <laughs> pithy answer is, Probably, maybe. The long answer is no. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's because chemically, you know, these are Science. chemical engines. Yeah, right. Nature doesn't <laughs> care. Um, but you could, I think it's, it's certainly we know that the amount of what's called metallicity in a star, which is the amount of stuff heavier mm-hmm. than, than helium, what the hell the astronomers called things like carbon and metal. But the point is, yeah. uh, and, and xeon and metal. As you... As you have higher metallicity, which again you can see in the, sun, in the planet's atmosphere, in the star's atmosphere, there's a good mm-hmm. chance that you're going to find more planets because it yeah. means there's more stuff than just hydrogen, helium, lithium available in exactly. the planetary disk, and that's borne out by the fact that planets with high metallicity are ones, or stars with high metallicity are the ones that we have found most of the planets or, uh, orbiting. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I love about planets because I, I often talk about this when I do outreach talks and stuff that stars are so much more predictable. We have a much better understanding of, okay, here's a star, this is its temperature, and we can figure out things like age and size and all of these things. There's there's a much better mapped out sort of formula of if these are some of its parameters, then we can deduce that these are some of the other it, parameters. It's that a measurement and, bias though. Is it just the fact that we've been no, able to it's, measure it's, them rather than the fact that that's I, the nature of I, them? Well, we've just been, we've been, we've studied STAR for so long and we have a good understanding about sort of internal processes that, that drive stars and like, why do they shine? We know these nuclear processes, we harness the, the power of the atomics, um, unfortunately. Um, but, but planets do not play ball in the same way. They're not that easy to categorize. You can't be like, oh, look, okay, here's a, a planet of this mass and radius. Therefore, it's probably this old or like this is its chemical composition. Stars are much more predictable in that way um, it's, it's but i love true. that about planets it's definitely true yeah i mean you can you can infer a lot from a planet from a star on the basis of its size and you can yeah. figure out where it is on the main sequence and yeah it's true i mean the chemical processing a star does is, is astonishing i mean you know, nuclear yeah. synthesis yeah. and stuff is incredible but yeah you're right they, they are they are they are tend to be more simplistic yeah. than the kinds of outcomes you can have in in the planet and a good here's a good example yeah. of that so it turns out that the most common size object we've detected by the way just another sidebar often people describe earth-like <clears throat> and they'll say oh we've found an earth-like world yeah. we are we are beginning to find earth-sized worlds of which venus yeah. is one venus is 95 percent the radius of earth we have never found an earth-like world and anyone saying they have is That's lying true. because yes. first we would have to know that it's got you know 20 Celsius average temperature in Ocean. And we don't yeah. have the I am positive there are Earth like worlds are there, but we haven't determined we have and we may even Definitely. have recognized them, but we haven't determined them to be like that yet. Um yeah. but basically the, the, the most common kind of world on the basis of size is what, what is colloquially referred to by astronomers as mini Neptunes. There and then there's actually this kind of perception that there is a gap between the largest known rocky worlds. And the way we know a rocky a world is rocky is, to be sure, you need two measurements. You need a measurement of its size or its radius, which we can get through uh, what's called the transitometry method when it passes in front of its star. And you also need to know its mass, which we can get through what's called the radial velocity method, which is an effect of the 
the, the actually the, the absorption spectrum of a star. But the point is, once you have an idea as to how big a star, a bit big a planet is, and what and what its size is and its mass, you can work out its density, and then you can begin to say, is it gas or is it rock? Because they have vastly right. different densities, and of course you're taking the whole bulk thing. So you, you have no prescriptive information as to how big the iron core, presumably as iron, would be versus anything else. But the mini Neptunes are complicated. They're bigger than the biggest super Earths, but they're smaller than the big definitively giant planets that are gaseous. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's led to this view that, that there's sort of two potential explanations to explain what a mini Neptune is. Um, and they may not be mutually exclusive. And one is that they are basically a smaller version of a giant planet um, and right now, we don't know what the inside of Neptune and Uranus look like. We don't know if it's a solid object or if it's a blend or whatever. Uh, but the other possibility is that they actually may be Earth-sized objects <clears throat> that have hap- happened to have grown a much thicker atmosphere as a consequence of, say, where they were born or the energy of their star, right? That combination, again, of mass and distance to your star. And it, and, and it just maybe it may be happenstance there isn't a mini Neptune in the solar system. And definitely there's an element of observational bias here because we are going to be presupposed to detecting worlds that are bigger or closer in and orbit faster because the orbital period is higher or whatever. But certainly mini Neptune seems to be a real thing. We don't see an example of it in the solar system, but maybe if through some reason Earth had formed farther out and it had gathered some thick vacacious envelope, but not as much to make it as a full-on Neptune or Uranus or, or, or bigger again. It may be it may be what we would now call a mini Neptune. It could be both of these. So understanding what these worlds are is extremely hard. And, and to your point, then you cannot look at the radius alone and say it's definitively exactly. this past. Whereas exactly. with a star, you can. You know it has to yeah. be fusion, basically. And and I mean with the star as well. Hello, look at our solar system. There are a bunch of planets. So just because you know what a star is doing doesn't mean that you know what its planets are doing because you can have such a range of planets as well. Absolutely. And also we don't know much yet about how planetary systems form, why yeah. things are in the position they are, why, you know, is there a particular reason why the giant plants are where they are? Um, yeah. We don't know that much then, about the Kuiper belt or the scatter disk beyond. We don't know that there might yeah. not be large rocky worlds farther out in deep space, but still gravitationally bound to the sun. So yeah. these are basic and things we can't answer. Something I often talk about um, when when talking to the general public and stuff is also, you know, what we say are like, oh, two planets that are similar. That's already making quite a lot of assumptions, because then if you say in our solar system, we have three sort of or four Mercury terrestrial type mm-hmm. planets, inner planets, but they are not really the same, are they? I mean, they're no. in the same category, but they're not. And I mean, even when you talk about things like climates and what the environment is physically on a planet, even if you just look at one planet, Earth, you've seen icebergs, you've seen the rainforest, you've Mm -hmm. seen deserts, even the conditions on a single planet can vary so hugely depending on where it is. And then you have different planets that have totally different climates and, and... and then you have different ones between different systems. So the, the the breadth of variation is just enormous. It is. It's crazy. And 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 what's interesting even there is the actual, like Mars has ice caps because there's a definitive difference in terms yeah. of its poles and its equator. But Venus doesn't. Venus is because of its very thick atmosphere. Oh, it's yeah. essentially made this, the whole, there's no sort meaningful of difference. Radiative the, transfer. Yeah, it's yeah. all the same. There is a difference in temperature with elevation, but not really with latitude. Um, yeah. And in the case of Mercury, there is uh, there are there's actually ice deposits in some what we call permanently shadowed craters in Mercury's poles. Yeah. So it again has that that pole to equator difference in temperature. And um, but you're right in movies where you see you know a desert planet or a jungle planet, it's yeah. very unlikely could just have landed there. That, right. That exactly right. But it's very they landed unlikely. in Dubai. <laughs> And that's that's the thing. That's just as valid a, pl- a place that's representative of Earth. In fact, more so, right. arguably, um, than boreal rainforests. You know. Yeah, so, I mean, the, exactly. There's that concept, isn't there, of rare Earth and like, look at how rare this planet is. But you could also flip that on its head and say maybe Earth isn't even the best place for life. Maybe there's other planets <laughs> yeah. out there that are, that are ridiculously there's suitable for There's someone that's literally life. paradise yeah, like, where yeah, everywhere literally. is 25 degrees. Yeah. You know, there <laughs> is, life there... is just clinging on on Earth. Yeah. But on these, on these <laughs> Earth planets, really like... Overcast. Like... And you know, there's definitely this, there is a view that you can have what are called super habitable planets that you can imagine Earth, but you make it better. You make it warmer. Mm. Yeah. You change the sun type so it's a bit more forgiving. Yeah. Chlorophyll might go, or, or whatever the equivalent yeah. chemical 
won't be red, but there are things you can do to actually make things even more clement. And what we do see is that, you know, Earth, life on Earth has become extremely resilient to these different environments. But yeah, and like I said, Earth was not always habitable and will not remain so indefinitely. Yeah. So definitely a matter can of I, timing as if, well. If we're customizing, can I vote for reducing gravity just by a tiny fraction so that we have this little light bounce in our step as we like jump up and pick grapes from this luscious uh, club? App- app- <laughs> apparently it's bad for you, though. Apparently if you, put, oh, if you go into an ex- slightly more yeah you know, slightly heavier gravity yeah. you heal quicker and stuff like that that was what i was that was another I'll, podcast i'll, I'll guest. take well if okay well if i'm living here and i'm just bouncing around picking up grapes then i'm okay with if i get injured i'll just hang out for a little while that's okay no, that's I, i'll that's sacrifice right. the that's healing right. time so but here's the thing have, oh, but, but unfortunately if you lynn go to a lower yeah. gravity planet you could band around the uh-huh. grapes so please check that it's not fully heavy metals or whatever right <laughs> But the problem is, if you evolve, uranium grapes. it could be uranium grapes, yeah, or some sort of neurotoxin. But if you evolve on a planet no. like that, all uh-huh. things be equal, you'll equilibrate with everything, and you won't bound That's any true. more than you bound here. And right Damn now, it. there's there are people having a podcast in another planetary system saying, "Oh, imagine only having nine point yeah. eight meters per second squared of gravity." Instead of 20. <laughs> yeah. Imagine how much My we bones bound. would be so dense. Yeah, and here we are going. <laughs> yeah. I don't bound. I walk no, and shuffle. That's so true. Honestly, I think yeah. your frame, your whole reference frame, would unfortunately also. You need to go to a place with no gravity. I will go and and visit. Okay, here's here's a question that I I've been wanting to ask as well. Let's say uh, magic wand. Um, I've just gone to Mars or Venus. You can choose. I'm assuming you're going to choose Venus. Um, and we cut out a big, huge, beautiful slab off the surface. And then you get to play with it in your lab at home. Like you, we take it back to Earth. You get to study it in whatever detail. What would you look at? Like what, what would you look at first? Um, let me preface this by saying that's something that I think I would like to see in my life in my lifetime. If we actually go yes. and do sample I, I return. Mean, you know, we are That'd doing. Be cool. Yeah, yeah. It would be technically challenging. Maybe more. not a big one kilometer chunk, but <laughs> no, probably not that much. But here's the thing: depending on what's happened in terms of the history of Venus, that actually may not be all that telling. If there were Ooh. older rocks, they may be now sufficiently deep that they are functionally out of reach. So what I would look at is I'd look. At, it turns out you can tell an awful lot about where, well, at least on Earth, where melt or magma has come from as a function of its trace elements chemistry. And that's the first thing we would do. It, and in fact, it turns out that if you take a basalt from Hawaii and a basalt from the Cascades and a basalt from the Mid-Ocean Ridge, they all have very subtle differences in the trace element chemistry that you can actually use to back out where they're from. So the first thing we would do would be to look at, assuming that we're talking about a basaltic rock, is what is it made of? What are the relative ratios of, of you know, it's these trace elements that would be extremely important um and then look at the crystals and try and work out what that tells you age dating we could do radiogenic age dating the way we do on earth all the time lead lead uranium thorium we could work out how old the surface is because we have virtually no information on that so there's a ton of really important things we could do but if i if we were to ever go back really far in Venus' history, which you can do on Mars easily because so little has happened. You can take a rock and you can be confident that it's about 4 billion years old. You can't do that on Venus. It would be like landing on Earth and picking a place. Where would you go to learn about Earth's history? You, there aren't many places you can go, but you yeah, could certainly learn a lot about its recent true. history. You could definitely do that. Yeah. Well, that is the point. I mean, I guess there are places on Earth that you could go where at least you could have an attempt to get slightly further back that you can get on other places on earth oh for sure yes exactly. and, and, and so could. could you i mean presumably we're nowhere near mapping venus to that quality where we could do a similar trick you know actually the maps of venus that we have are not bad they're not complete they're not great they're big questions i can't answer because of the data but we got some pretty good data 30 years ago global scale data of the surface and people did map it now some of the conclusions i think are questionable and that's part of what i'm working on in my day-to-day life um but there are places where we think at least they are the locally oldest materials um i tend to view them as being much younger than other people think but they are locally relatively old and they would definitely be places that we want to go and take samples from the problem is that that kind of terrain unit is called tessera it's the word used for for this set of stuff on venus it's we think very rough and and probably not safe at lander scale and so until and if, which we will now 
get, thankfully, in the next 10 years with these new missions, we will get high resolution radar images of this kind of ground. It'll become much easier then to design a lander to be resilient to the shape of, of, the, of the rocks and the distribution of rocks and the slopes and stuff. Um, landing there, even not bringing that home, landing there with a miniaturized lab like we've done for Mars. But of course, because of the temperature pressure conditions, this is going to take more money, a lot more money, because Mars is, it's not easy to do. Well, Chris, Curiosity and Perseverance have done, but it is technically less challenging than doing the same thing on Venus. Even though I think personally there's a more compelling science reason to do it for Venus, mm. the reason humans have spent so much time and money investing in Mars is because it is relatively easier to do. Not easy, but relatively <laughs> easy. You don't, yeah. It's easy to keep electronics cool, uh, <clears throat> warm with the heater. It's very hard to keep them cool in the case of Venus. Um, but certainly if we were able to go and land on one of these so-called tesser regions, they are at least the locally oldest stuff there are hypotheses we could test there. I'd love to know what that stuff is made of. And that is one of the places I would go. Does so it get that, you back a billion years? I don't know. But it, it's no. definitely worth doing. What What about, you know, the, this this whole like the vibrating the planet and banging it like a bell so that you can see, you know, like, cracking um, it open, it, like, it, like, like, like a coconut. Insight is doing and things like that, you know. Yeah. It, <laughs> So, like, that works to a point. But, like, so Insight is a passive system, right? It doesn't have the ability to make a noise. And they were relying, they have been relying on, you know, bolides, things hitting the atmosphere or hitting the ground, and natural quakes. And, and we know Mars is tectonically active, and I don't think anyone seriously thought it wasn't. But now we have a much better idea of, like, what that rate is, what the processes and mechanisms are. Yeah, how much. Yeah, exactly. Um, the biggest quakes in the solar system, with the exception of when you get a giant impact, are probably quakes associated with subduction on Earth because of the nature of how it works and how big a quake you could make. You could probably make moderately big quakes on Venus, yes. Um, the problem is you need to be there for a while. You know, that's the, to get a sense of what the kind of background base level is. And this, the temperatures really kill you. It's the pressure we can build, we can build stuff against 990 bars. But it's the temperature. And, and and there's been, in the last few years, some really exciting work out of NASA Glenn, for example, in, in Ohio, where they've been developing silicon carbide transistors and things that are designed to operate healthily and fully at ambient Venus temperature. And as that technology goes on further, you know, we'll see in the next, I'm hoping, 10 years, we'll be able to build a lander that it won't be some sort of steampunk thing. It won't be some sort of, you know, Victorian and <laughs> these ideas. It'll be a regular lander and it won't have any <clears throat> cooling. It will be designed yeah. to function at those temperatures. Wasn't you can that imagine that what happened to wasn't that what happened when the, the 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 Soviet lander? It didn't last very long. It lasted. So this is I might you, you can see in my background picture we're, we're resuming. You, I have a background kind of my art expression of what one of the Venera Soviet landers looked like yeah. in one of the planes. Yeah. yeah, those things are still there. By the way, they're made of titanium, so they haven't melted. Oh, I love that. They've, they've probably they've probably undergone some sort of tarnishing, I'm guessing. Yeah. And certainly all the electronics are dead, but they're physically, there's no reason they're not physically intact. They've only been there a few decades. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the longest lasting one was 127 minutes. Um, now, to be fair, it actually lasted longer, but we got 127 minutes of data because the data were relayed to the orbiter, which was overflying. And once it goes out of right, range, right, it right, transcends right. stuff home. So it probably lasted a little longer, but not more, maybe an hour. Not much. Not, not days. I feel so bad picturing this rover like, <gasps> save me. <laughs> and then just buckling slowly, under just the horrendous. boiling to death. Yeah, well, I mean, da, Vinci, oh, da Vinci's God. not supposed to last that much longer, is it? It's, no, it it's... won't. So Da Vinci's going to go through the atmosphere. It's an hour through the atmosphere, we think, is how long the, the, the descent will take. In fact, is Da Vinci is going to take an image of, of one of these tesserated regions, um, and then it's going to, it's going to fall uh, it's not required to survive the landing. It probably will, because these things are really engineered. This is a big, you know, titanium pressure ball a meter across. This thing is strong. But the, the electronics are not going to be cooled much beyond, you know, I don't know. I think people are forecasting, you know, this thing, if it, if it doesn't last until the surface, we're still going to get unbelievable science from it. But, you know, there's, the, there's a non-zero chance. And it's also a ball. It's got no legs or anything. There's a non-zero chance this thing hits and rolls. And then we get a photo, like, you know, it might be at a jaunty angle of a photo of the horizon, you know, which would be the first such photo in 40 years. Um, but yeah, it will quickly expire then because it is it is not designed to, yeah. to live those temperatures. We've been so spoiled by all the beautiful photos from Mars. <laughs> Mars is easy. Space but cold it's is much easy. easy. Just, yeah. and, and, and it has a, it's a nuclear powered battery at the back. It's generating yeah. heat. They can run in to keep the keep easy the chassis peasy. warm. 
You know, it's They're what having Mark a nice Watney cold did. winter walk. <laughs> it's exactly yeah. as Mark Watney did it in the Marshall. He put one into his rover and drove around with it. Yeah, spreading. no problem. Uh, but you, 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 and it, people propose using nuclear systems actually to cool the rovers on Mars or on Venus, but that technology just doesn't exist yet and it's expensive to develop. It's yeah. probably not physically impossible, it's just expensive. And sure, really what sure. it comes down to is I think these new missions are probably going to go give us this new. They're going to jumpstart, I hope, at least a new era of Venus exploration that will then show people it's worth investing in the kinds of technology yeah. to to ultimately, I'm sure there is no physical reason we cannot have a Venus rover, but it's going yeah. to be technologically yeah. expensive and difficult to develop. 2030s? Ballpark? 2040s. What do you think? 2040s. 2040s. Yeah. Be lucky to 2030s see. 2030s design, 2040s. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, early 20, late 2020s, early 2030s, um, new missions to Venus. Potentially yeah. new lander, maybe in the late 2030s, in the Fingers 2040s. Crossed. Then I mean, it just depends on a yeah. bunch of things. It depends on you know the availability of the rockets that are you know. And, and the motivation. Well, uh, yeah, I was going to say if something amazing comes out of Da Vinci, there might be a massive rush to yeah. go to that go oil back. found yeah. on yeah. Venus. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's so much easier to go and dig it up there or fusion fuel. I mean, yeah. that, exactly. dinosaur I, juice. <laughs> yeah, we could. I, I joke with people. This I want to be very clear. I just joke, but. Most limestones on Earth are made of the shells of dead creatures. So I'm yeah. like, I can't wait to find the first limestone beds on Venus from those <laughs> shallow marine seas they had before the climate catastrophe. Uh, what, okay. No uh, evidence uh, controver- that ever Controversial on question then. Limestones uh, more likely on Mars or on Venus? <laughs> um, well, you see, so you can produce limestones um, abiotically. And I organic think there's definitely, limestone. yeah, you know, inorganically. <laughs> or, I, I personally don't think Mars was ever inhabited, or if it was, it was never mm. to very much. If there's any life on Mars, my view is that it's hundreds of meters down, which no amount of yeah. drilling is going to get until humans are there. Um, yeah. That's my own personal view. And I also don't think there's anything living on Venus. There may have been. If, well, this if is you the... were to ask to me to to conjecture completely, like beyond the realms of any kind of defense mm-hmm. and science, then I would pick Venus because it's an Earth-sized Yeah, yeah. if if I ask more like, there was on one, which one do you think it was? <laughs> I don't it, think yeah. Mars ever had, I don't think it had no. seas. It may have had wet, ponded craters for a while. Yeah, swamps. You know? Yeah. But this is the thing, you know, we had this, uh, we had this um, on our episode with Jessica Abbott about um, biology um, perspective. And one of the conclusions that we sort of talked about was that life in the universe, like bacteria type life, like simple life, totally, probably, that feels very reasonable that that could be um, widespread in the universe. Intelligent life, like sort of life with organs, <laughs> And like skin and stuff like that. That's really it's a bigger jump. There's a bigger jump from zero to bacteria than bacteria to like mammals. Let's say. I mean, certainly that, the that idea... was at least our our guesstimation. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the Cambrian explosion, we know that Earth has been inhabited for at least 3.4 billion years old. We think. I suspect right. many people suspect longer, but of course the record isn't there. Um, but complex life with organs, organelles, right. with the bo- different body forms, um, mm-hmm. they've been only around for 540 million years. Which is so nothing. for for almost three billion years, this planet had just like single yeah. cell stuff popping along. And that's the thing. And you know, to to uh, shoehorn my pet subject of exoplanets back in as well. I mean, it's not that often, probably, that planets are blessed with such a stable environment for a long period of time. Not necessarily. That's, that there is there is a big topic or a big focus uh, discipline called dynamic habitability, and that's exactly the topic. Mm, it's like exactly, what yeah. conditions do you need or not need for yeah. habitable conditions to be sustainable over long yeah. enough periods of time mm. for for abiogenesis and for the yeah. generation it's of like, life from non-life. I mean, it might the, only the be race. feasible in certain parts of the galaxy, mightn't it? In the actual galactic. Yeah, people yeah. Have, uh, have proposed yeah. too that if you want, you don't be too close because there's too much radiation. You don't be too far away because there isn't enough star right, forming right. matter for your metallicity to be high enough to produce planets. Absolutely, there could yeah. be a stellar neighborhood where it happens. But you yeah. know what? I'm positive that all those things, those ideas are wrong because it's probably far <laughs> more complicated <laughs> than we think. It's probably yeah. much, much more complicated than we think. I, I mean, very much like useful frameworks to start. Yeah. Yeah, I think you, yeah. you, you've kind of demonstrated it several times in our chat that science is so complicated that even accepted ideas and accepted kind of frameworks that they they come and they go very very yeah. rapidly. And and I, I guess I I guess it's we we may have to finish it here because we've borrowed you for an hour and a half here. For- <laughs> I do need to go eat lunch before my next yeah. meeting, but but I've also really enjoyed it, and I'm always happy to come back. Yeah. We've only 
scratch oh, the uh, surface. Uh, so. I definitely have to get you back because yeah, yeah the, you you are racing along with some unbelievably interesting <laughs> thing, and, and I, I I need some time to to soak it all in. And, and <laughs> we need a part let's, two. We need let's a part do two let's do let's do um, why is Venus better than Mars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's and a, just okay. like a it's, smackdown. <laughs> it's an Earth-sized world. Why would you look at a small yeah. nugget when you have a big Earth-sized exactly. world? End off. That's it. Yeah. It's size alone. Yeah. End off. And honestly, like with the with with astrobio, I feel like so many of us who study astro or I feel like so many of us go from you know as kids, it's like don't be stupid. Of course, aliens don't exist. That's like ghosts. And then you learn about science. You're like, oh my god, maybe aliens exist. Maybe life. I mean, there are so much. And then you think about what actually would be needed for intelligent life to evolve, and you're like, yeah, I might not be super likely. But yeah, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's almost depressing. Kind of like- but you know what? Yeah. I I am convinced that they're intelligent. Like as evinced by saying, you know creatures with society and radio mm-hmm. and space travel and atomic power. Yeah. I'm positive that they exist throughout the galaxy. Because of the sheer somewhere. number of worlds, it seems extremely yes. unlikely to be that they don't. The problem is yeah. the temporal aspect. Mm. If a civilization exactly. lasts a million years, which is very unrealistically long, yeah. we could miss each other by five million years. And all we might get if we had the ability to go to a different solar system, which we probably will never have. But if we did, we may find mm-hmm. relics or weird radioisotopes in their soil or an yeah. artifact yeah. on the moon. That's all that's exactly. left. So the likelihood yeah. of actually communicating with anybody. But you know what? I'll, I'll leave you with this. I think at least it's possible that the way we might discover that we're not alone, at least this is, I think, an exciting possibility, we'll get to the point in the future where we may be able to get low-resolution images of exoplanets, and that's a long way away, and that's an extremely tall order. But yeah. being able to detect lights on the night side of a planet, wouldn't that be something? <sighs> Yeah, Even if they were so far cities. away, they could you never talk. Yes. To them. Couldn't it be like photo, you know, um, you know, l- like jellyfish and things like that? Well, so, so <laughs> like bioluminescent. Uh, uh, hey, so that's first still off, light. You'd have to work out what wavelength it is. You'd have to work out is it is it steady mm-hmm. or not? Is it forest fires? Does the distribution of those lights change yeah. through time? You is know, there like an automatic, years? you know, where at six o'clock all the lights come on? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe they're <laughs> very energy efficient. But I think yeah. you could certainly look at things like that and see how those things, if the positions of those things on repeated orbits doesn't change, yeah. that's pretty clear that they're immobile. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then sort you could also look for combustion products in the atmosphere. Yeah, you would look for things like exactly techno signatures. But I think yeah. it, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that that might be, not through finding some microbial fossil from Mars sample we brought up, yeah. but actually finding ev- some kind of evidence of a non-naturally occurring signature of some kind. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, a radio signal would be nice. Yeah. yeah, the only problem is like even now, this is you the know, top I mean, of the pops. But if you grew up watching, you know, I mean, if you saw the movie Contact, it's idea of like a big radio mm-hmm. sphere that doesn't exist anymore because now most TV is broadcast via radio, via microwave, which yeah. is beamed from trans- transmitters and transmitters, not going into space anymore. So yeah. You know, and even then, once you get beyond, like I don't know, twenty or thirty light years, or something, that stuff is diffused so much that you can't pick it out of the background noise. Yeah. That's, yeah. So in other words, picking up alien TV signals is not a good way of doing it. Which means they'd have to <laughs> know we're here and be broadcasting stuff, probably on broadband. You know, like well, th- a, well, that's a that. focused beam, more like. Well, that's the thing that Arecibo could do, isn't it? It could actually, it could actually send a yes, signal could, as well did. as receive. They did. They sent yeah. it to nearby star systems, and then, and then it fell down because it wasn't maintained, and now we don't, aren't necessarily <laughs> listening for a reply. So. Uh-oh. Can you imagine what it's like trying Come to have conversations with someone by le- messages in a bottle? Uh, now multiply yeah. that by a million. Right? That's how it's going uh, no, to And I now know. we're ghosting them. They're going to be so mad. Uh, yeah, ghosting them by <laughs> thousands of years. Yeah, they're, like well, they're going to come and, over and be like, why didn't you reply? In, in whatever our planetary system is named, they're like, well, we're not going to yeah. send them a Christmas card or whatever. They yeah. Right. Like. yeah, We were well, going to invite them to intergalactic well, society, but no. <laughs> I hope Paul doesn't ghost me when we, we get part two. That's I'll be delighted I'm to come back <laughs> and wax further lyrical about planets. Uh, well, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks very much for coming on, Paul. These are absolutely genius. I, I, there's so many. There's there's some brilliant things in there. I, my, I just, my, I, my brain I, is I hurting. Literally, my brain is blown by that that whole <laughs> that whole having that <laughs> atmospheres are held on by magnetic fields. Oh no, they're not. I'm, I'm, oh yeah, of course yeah, they're not. Oh no, wait, I don't even know yeah, why. I don't even know what, why I've ever fallen for it. <laughs> yeah, but you I'm know so what? glad <laughs> no one's asked me that because I would have been called out. <laughs> I was at a I was at a meeting last year where I learned all this, and I was I was chairing oh, a, a virtual okay, meeting. I was chairing a session, and I was like, "Wait, what?" And they were like, "Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like Venus could lose a bar of atmosphere a million years, and we wouldn't know." I'm like, "Fuck, okay, yeah." <laughs> I mean, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. But but you know what that is? That is not looking at the geology, and once you factor in things like outcasting, yeah. which is geological phenomenon suddenly you realize actually mm. it's about balance and loss and you know gain mm. and loss and stuff so 
I, I think yeah. I think I'm going to have to study a little bit more about plate tectonics to get back because that's clearly important, isn't it? In it's terms yeah. of, super important. Yeah, I need to I need to yeah. get I need to brush up on that and we'll do a deep deep dive because okay. I think I can't help feeling that that. Well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I, I will leave you with this. We have through, thanks to seismic tomography, we have imaged the old plates that used to be up there. They're now lying down at the Coromandel Ooh. boundary. We can see them. Whoa! Yeah, that, oh. used, that used to be ocean Geology floor. rocks. That's down there now slowly diffusing back into the lower mantle. Uh, that that's it. it. It kind of reminds me of black holes, the fact that information, all that information is being sort of <laughs> yeah. lost forever into yeah, the... Yeah, yeah. Into the... Uh, or maybe yeah, it's been brilliant. stored somewhere. We don't know. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to go get yeah. lunch. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. doing great. Thank you for inviting me. The Interplanetary Podcast is alive! There were so many times during that where I was sitting there slightly with my mind blown. But I, I, we, we, we have to get Paul back on. We have to get, we have to get all your guests back on. To be honest, Lynn. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, make we, some calls. I need, <laughs> Paul, I need if to you're do, listening, come back. I, uh, yeah, I need, I need to do some deeper dives on it. I need to do some deeper dives. I always, I we, always. We had more questions, didn't we? Definitely have more questions. I definitely have more questions. Um, what, what are you doing? What are you doing at the moment, Lynn? Are you doing anything very cool? Actually, well, only always. Um, I'm actually preparing for um, tomorrow night. I have to uh, go to work at uh, 10 p.m. and then be awake until 10 a.m. because I am going to be doing some remote observations with the Kyros Plus telescope uh, at the VLT in Paranal in Chile. Whoa. And we're, yeah, if humidity doesn't bugger everything up, then we will have some beautiful transits, <laughs> which I've talked about a lot. You know, when the planets go in front of the stars and we get to look at their beautiful atmospheres. But I'm really annoyed at the weather on the other side of the world right now. So fingers oh, crossed, everyone. Oh, doesn't, doesn't it look that good? I thought it was always uh, dry and chilly. Yeah, except for when it's slightly not. I mean, you know, dryness there or humidity there is like, oh, no, I found a water molecule like, within this 10 uh, kilometer thousand, radius. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. God damn but it. we don't like them. We don't like yeah, them. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's oh. awesome! Is it one of those telescopes that fires a laser into the atmosphere and 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 all and adaptive optics? <laughs> yeah, this oh. this is the 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 laser guide stars are the ones that we use um at uh, at the VLT. The Cryos Plus instrument that I'm using, actually, you know what? Little brainwave. We should totally do an episode on um on spectroscopy as a Ooh, whole. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's so much, you know. For you listeners who are listening to this, you know, we've been talking about astrobiology and when we talk about these like sort of more astrophysics science-y parts of space, you might be sitting there thinking like, well, how do you even know? Yeah. <laughs> how do you actually know that this is like helium or hydrogen or oxygen or whatever that you're finding in space? Because we could just be, it's not like we're going up to the cloud and scooping up a little jar and being like, oh yeah, that's totally hydrogen gas. <laughs> <laughs> And the answer is spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is is spectroscopy. definitely a pretty important subject, isn't it? It's and and it, it I guess it's <laughs> it's it's actually quite easy to do as well. I mean, you can do spectroscopy as a as an amateur astronomer. Yeah, as well. yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we used to do um we used to do these uh, um outreach stuff um with schools, and the one that we used to do. I mean, okay, first of all, you need like a cylinder of. <laughs> of a plasma type of gas. So that's like the hard one to do, but everything else you can use from home. Um, we used to get uh, broken up like uh, CD, CD discs. Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. Those, for those Zoomers that are listening, they are these flat circular things that used to play Had music, music on them. songs. Yeah. I know, crazy. You could, get um, a, you could get about 12 songs on it. That's how massive yeah. they were. Whoa. <laughs> and... <laughs> Oh, yeah, if you then if you then just smash it up into uh, chunks, and then you take a um, like empty toilet roll, like the cardboard of a, a, a depleted toilet roll, um, and you put in the broken CD at a sort of angle, then you can actually use that um, to to see spectral lines. Uh, and if you're able to do it in a safe way, you can point out the sun and you can actually see the spectral lines of the sun doing this. Because really, I mean, a CD, it does have like microscopic grooves on it, which is the same principles um, that we use in spectroscopy. Whew. Next, you'll be telling me you can do an MRI scan with a couple of speakers and a webcam. <laughs> Tune in next time. <laughs> 
Well, uh, I'm not going to be doing anything exciting because I'm, I'm working so hard at the moment. Uh, the Spodcats may have noticed that my my output has been slightly shoddy. So normal, boo. I know, no, boo, boo, indeed. <laughs> no, uh, the the normal service will return once once this term this horrific term two finishes in uh, Easter time. So I'll be back to to regular once a week. But yes. in the meantime, I am still we're still. Keep doing some pretty cool episodes, isn't that right? I there? mean, so, you're cranking out. You, how many episodes so, are we up to now? Yes, it's a lot. <laughs> I <laughs> wonder how of, long it would be if you played them all back to back. There's more hours of interplanetary podcast than I've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> it would take That's a lifetime to listen to listen <laughs> yeah, yeah. to them all now. <laughs> Something yeah, like well, that. I think that's the statistic. De- definitely. I mean, well, okay. So, so listeners, uh, you know, patience is a virtue. This is a a, a, a great service that is being uh, delivered into your ear holes for free. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess Spotify or something costs money, but you know. Yeah, you can do it on Google Podcasts. That would be free, or you could that's do true. it via, via the SoundCloud, or you could do it via you could do it you can do it from anywhere. The, the podcast, yeah. even you on YouTube, come, you can even go to you YouTube can, and watch it. <laughs> You can come it, to Matt's it. house and put your ear against the window, <laughs> yeah. and at least you get. And hear me of editing it, it. yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That would be... <laughs> just the <laughs> silence sounds of you clicking the mouse. Yeah, it wouldn't be good. Don't do that. Um, but yeah, yes, please don't go to Matt's house. <laughs> as as always, thanks very much for the patrons who who have been bearing with me and and keeping up the banter in the Discord, which has been very good. I've been enjoying a lot of it. There's some big, good ones like. A t-shirt with Space Force with with, a, with an astronaut punching E.T. That's quite good. <laughs> so, uh, where do I buy these? <laughs> I know. I know. I might actually buy one. Um, but that's it, Lynn. Thanks Thanks so much for, for, for stepping in again and getting that brilliant interview. And uh, Thank I you think, so much. I think it's probably time to say bye-bye to this podcast. Bye. Bye-bye, Spodcast. Bye-bye, Spodcast. Bye-bye.